I'm Tom Moore. I am the Archibald Granville Bush Professor of Science here and Chair of the Department of Physics. And uh, there's been two questions that I've gotten over the last week or so. The first one has always been, uh, why am I calling the Physics Department for information? And the second one is, where is the Galloway Room? Uh, well, we answered the second one. The reason for the first one is, is uh, all I can say is welcome to Rollins. Uh, we don't so much try and think outside the box here as we do is try and eliminate the boxes. And so uh, I am part of the team that actually brought uh, our theologians here today. Uh, we're fortunate to have the opportunity today to actually eavesdrop on a uh, discussion about a topic that is uh, of importance to all Christians. But I think it is also important to people of other faiths as well as agnostics and atheists. Uh, we have here an opportunity to, to listen to two well-respected people who disagree on something that is important theologically. And the intent is not to convince anyone of one position or another, uh, but to open the discussion. And we hope, as, as faculty and staff, that, that after this is over, the students and the faculty and staff will continue this discussion for quite a long time. Uh, we sometimes, I think, believe that topics of faith are off limits. Uh, and there's two reasons for this in a secular uh, world and secular uh, college like we have. One of them is, is we're scared of offending anyone. And the second reason is, is I think we don't want to sound like we're pros proselytizing. Uh, but I, one has to ask oneself if you can't have a discussion like this at a liberal arts college, just where can you have it? And so we're hoping that this initiates these kinds of discussions for quite some time. The topic under discussion today is whether there was a physical resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth and whether it's necessary for a Christian to actually believe that. Uh, our two guests have thought deeply about the subject and we're fortunate to have him here. Uh, first I'd like to introduce Marcus Borg. He is the canon theologian at Trinity Episcopal Cathedral in Portland, Oregon. He holds degrees from Concordia College, Union Seminary, and Oxford University. He's a prolific author and fellow of the Jesus Seminar, and he was the Hundare Distinguished Professor of Religion and Culture at Oregon State University until his retirement in 2007. He joins us thanks to the generosity of the Thomas P. Johnson Foundation. Professor Borg is a proponent of what he terms progressive Christianity. Joining him in the discussion is uh, Rever Reverend Charlie Holt. Father Holt's the rector of St. Peter's Episcopal Church in Lake Mary. He holds degrees from the University of Florida and Seabury Western Theological Seminary with further study at uh, the Reformed Theolo Theological Seminary. Uh, Reverend Holt has been an active member of the Episcopal Church in uh, many aspects, both nationally and locally, and he's a proponent of what may be called the orthodox view of Christianity. <coughs> the format today is one of discussion and not debate. Uh, each of our guests is going to introduce their, their uh, view of the physical resurrection for however long they want. Uh, Professor uh, uh, Borg is going to start, and then Professor Holt's going to take exactly that amount of time to, <laughs> to introduce his. Um, and, and we will save time for questions. Uh, I think that that's an important part of this event. Uh, one final note before we start, uh, lest you think that this topic is, is just a simple theological difference between two different faiths, I'd like to point out, for those of you who don't realize it, that both of our guests come from the same faith tradition. Uh, obviously, uh, Father Holt is a rector of an Episcopal church, uh, Professor Borg is a canon theologian at the Episcopal Cathedral, and his wife is an Episcopal priest. I think these issues, these deep, deep theological issues, are seldom simple, and I think this is just one more instance. So with that, you don't want to listen to me, so without further delay, I'm going to turn the floor over to Professor Borg with the question, if one believes in the meaning of the resurrection, is it really necessary to believe in the physical resurrection? Let me begin by checking out my microphone. Anybody having any trouble hearing me? I sound a little bit like the voice of God to myself, so it must be okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm pleased to be here and to be doing this with Charlie. And as uh, Tom just mentioned, this is not a debate or an argument about the resurrection, but perhaps we might more appropriately say a dialogue. 
Now, that doesn't mean it's not going to be interesting, but it's not about scoring points or anything like that. And um, we have agreed that we won't take more than 10 minutes apiece, and he's going to try to take the exact amount of time that I take. And I'll give you my timer so you can watch it down to the second. Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> let me start here. I sometimes say about the stories of Jesus' birth, believe whatever you want about what happened, now can we talk about what those stories mean? And that's the approach that I take to the stories of the resurrection of Jesus, or what I'm going to call in shorthand Easter, the Easter stories. Believe whatever you want about what happened. Now can we talk about what those stories mean? So let me now apply that. I want to say that it's hard to be certain about what happened on the first Easter morning. I know the stories of the New Testament, the story of the empty tomb, and so forth. And, but to focus on... Um, what happened, I think, risks becoming a distraction. And so I go immediately for the question, what did Easter mean for the first followers of Jesus as reported in the New Testament? And there, I think, the answer is pretty clear. It meant primarily two things. The first thing it meant to his followers was, and I'll put it in a sentence and I'd eventually reduce it to a two-word sentence. The first thing it meant for them is Jesus continued to be experienced as a figure of the present. And not just as a beloved memory from the past. I think some of the followers of Jesus clearly had experiences of him after his death. Uh, the closest we have to a first-hand account of that, of course, is with the Apostle Paul. Uh, we have a second-hand account of that twice in, uh, or three times actually, in the book of Acts. And Paul also refers to it in his letters. Uh, Paul claims to have experienced the risen Christ, and, and I take him seriously. I think he did. Well, how did Paul experience the risen Christ? Clearly, it was a visionary experience. Some three to five years after the death of the historical Jesus, long after the time span for the gospel stories of the appearances of Jesus, Paul has this vision on the road to Damascus. And um, I think other of Jesus' early followers had visions as well. Paul provides a list in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and following of those to whom the risen Christ appeared. And he uses the same verb all the way through. He appeared to Peter. He appeared to the twelve. He appeared to 500 of the brothers and sisters all at once. And then last of all, in untimely fashion, he appeared also to me. He uses the same verb throughout, implying that those appearances are more or less of the same kind visions. Sometimes people will say, you mean it was only a vision? And I will say, anybody who's ever had a vision would never say, ah, it was only a vision. I think there may have been non-visionary experiences of Jesus after his death too. Experiences of the same spirit that his followers had known in him and around him during his lifetime continuing to be experienced in the community. So, in shorthand, Jesus lives. That's the first meaning of Easter that's so clear in the New Testament. Second meaning of Easter, Jesus is Lord. Now that's real different from Jesus lives. They're not contradictory, don't get me wrong. But it's much more than Jesus lives. For example, studies suggest that even today, half of... Um, surviving spouses will have at least one vivid experience of their deceased spouse. So vivid that 
they're sure the person is there in the room for a moment or whatever. And whatever the appearances of the risen Christ were like, they weren't simply like that. You know, if you experience your deceased spouse, you're not going to say, my Lord and my God. You might say, oh my God, but you wouldn't say, <laughs> my Lord and my God. There was something about the experience of the risen Christ that led to that exclamation. And to call Jesus Lord is also to say, God has vindicated Jesus, said yes to Jesus and what Jesus was about, and raised him to God's right hand, which is a position of authority and honor and so forth, and obviously metaphorical language, but a real claim. So, what did Easter mean for the earliest followers of Jesus? Jesus continues to be experienced. Jesus is Lord. And I think experiences of Jesus continue to this day. I have three minutes left, if I keep myself to ten minutes. Now let me apply that to what I call a parabolic reading of the Easter stories. The model for this, of course, is the parables of Jesus. I don't know any Christian who insists that the parables that Jesus told have to be factual or he's just making this stuff up, you know? I don't know anybody who insists that there had to be uh, a good Samaritan who behaved in the way the good Samaritan did in order for that story to have any merit. We all recognize that parables are about meaning and parables, in that sense, can be truth-filled, truthful. And to treat something as a parable doesn't mean you have to argue that it didn't happen, but you read it parabolically. Let me do, now do that quickly with the story of the empty tomb. It's the story that the Gospel of Mark ends with. Mark, of course, is the first Gospel. So this is the first Easter story now, Paul refers to the resurrection of Jesus, but he never tells an Easter story. So our earliest story of Easter is the ending of Mark's gospel. And the story is familiar to you. Uh, on the morning we call Easter Sunday, three of Jesus' women followers go to the tomb in order to anoint the body of Jesus. They get to the tomb and, by God, the stone has been rolled away and the tomb is empty, and there is an angel standing there who says, uh, you seek Jesus of Nazareth, whom they crucified. He is not here. He is risen. A parabolic reading of that story. You won't find Jesus in the land of the dead. Luke even applies it that way. In Luke, the angel says, Why do you seek the living amongst the dead? Absolutely perfect. Jesus lives. You won't find him in the land of the dead. Continuing the parabolic reading meaning of that story. The empire killed him. The authorities killed him and put his body in a rich man's tomb. But even the authorities and a tomb couldn't hold him, couldn't stop him. He's out there again. He's loose in the world. He's still recruiting for the kingdom of God. You get all of that from a parabolic reading of these stories. And one of the questions I may eventually ask you, Charlie, is what is added by believing that his physical body was actually transformed? Or what is lost by leaving that question in abeyance? Ten minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'd like to approach uh, my opening remarks uh, with a little bit of, of who I am and where I'm coming from, not, not only for your benefit, but also for Marcus's benefit. 
I was actually raised in a home that was not a church-going home. So I, I was basically, we, we said prayers at dinner time, but that was about the extent of my understanding of who God was. And I, and I even didn't fully, not, I look back on those prayers, but I, my dad always kind of ended them very quickly. And I always wondered, what is Psalm in? And uh, he was uh, saying that prayer so quickly that I didn't even understand what he was saying. But m my parents um, went through a very difficult divorce, and my mother actually was the first one in my family to become a Christian. And very, very uh, uniquely, I haven't heard very many people with this uh, as their testimony, but she became a Christian through her suffering and her reading of the book of Job and gave her life to the Lord. And she wanted my sister and I to also um, learn the Christian faith and to become Christian in our, in our perspective. And so we started going to a Methodist church and my mother and my sister and I were all baptized and I, this was about when I was in eighth grade. So then, it, from my mother's perspective, she felt it was important that I get a Christian education. So I was sent to Episcopal High School in Jacksonville for my Christian education. And at Episcopal High School, I learned a version of Christianity which essentially taught that the stories of Jesus are what matter. But the actual history of what happened doesn't matter. And the most vivid example that I can remember from my New Testament class, and this was taught by Episcopal priests, was that the story, take the story of, of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. That what's important in that story is the meaning and the moral teaching of that story, what maybe you just called the parabolic meaning and significance. But whether Jesus really raised Lazarus from the dead is, is irrelevant. And that we as uh, people need to take the moral and spiritual meaning of it. Well, as a as a high school student, and maybe I looked at things fairly unsophisticatedly, but uh, I listened to that and I, and I said, well, if they're just stories and they're just myths, then what's the point? And I actually rejected the faith. And I can remember um, going to argue with my mother around the kitchen table uh, with the things that I had learned from the priest at Episcopal High School as to why uh, she should reject Christianity. Now, that's kind of a strange uh, thing to be arguing from things you learned from clergy uh, with your mother, but that was, that was my high school time, and it went on for years. And she, uh, like Monica uh, Augustine's mother, kept praying for her son. And my, um, I didn't really uh, come to a vibrant faith in Jesus until I actually heard a different way of presenting the Gospels and a different way of telling the Christian story. And that way included, didn't exclude seeing the stories for their power and their meaning and teaching moral and spiritual points, but it included a belief that these stories actually are true and that they are not just true in the sense of conveying moral and spiritual values and truths, but true in the sense that they happened, that Jesus really did rise from the dead bodily, and Jesus really did um, speak to the tomb of Lazarus and say, come out, and he really did come out after having been uh, dead for several days. And I had never heard that perspective before, actually. It was a new uh, teaching to me, and one that struck me as something that, well, I have to wrestle with this. At a certain point, I came to grips with that I really did believe that Jesus rose from the dead bodily, that he, um, he really did, uh, uh, that that wasn't just a story as I had been taught <coughs> in uh, high school, but it, it was a historic event. The day that that happened for me, I uh, was with a, a large group of Christians and one of the things that they challenged me to do is to bear witness to that. 
and they had a, a moment where they, call, they called it a say-so, where I could stand up and say so, that I believed that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and that I had given my life to him. And I stood up and I said that. I believe Jesus is my Lord, and I have given my life to him. The leader of that retreat, and this is when I was a senior in high school, said, uh, I want to challenge everybody to learn a verse of scripture. And he had us memorize a passage of scripture. And that scripture was, whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And for me, that has been um, defining for my understanding of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in that from that point on, as Paul says in that section of 2 Corinthians, I no, no longer looked at things from a flesh, fleshly point of view. I no longer had what I now would call a secular worldview. And as I look back on what those priests taught me at Episcopal High School, I believe that what they had taught me was a way of looking at the New Testament and a way of looking at the story of Jesus and integrating that with really a secular-minded worldview, one that feels comfortable and is palatable to the secular community and, and the secular state of affairs and the secular way of looking at things on the part of actually many in the Western world. And, and I think that's actually why it sells pretty well. And, and unfortunately, I, I don't think that version of telling the story of Christianity actually has any power because many people, and myself being an example, but I don't think I'm the only example, uh, hear that way of telling the Christian story and, and do what I did. Go, well, if it's just a parable, if it's just a meaningful story, then what's the point? And, and I guess I would end with that as a question for you. Um, how would you answer that question? You know, if, it, if, it's, if it's a story, if it's a good story, but there's no historical basis for these, uh, if Jesus of history is different from the Jesus of faith, what, what's the point? Hmm. I think in many ways, um, <clears throat> Let, let, let me do it this way. I don't for a moment, and I know I'm shifting stories here, okay. but I'll apply it. I don't for a moment believe there was ever a Garden of Eden or that there was ever an Adam and Eve or that there's ever a talking snake. And yet, I find those stories to be powerfully and profoundly true. I would never say about, oh, it's just a myth. I think some of the most important things are either best expressed or maybe can only be expressed in the language of symbol and metaphor. And I seldom use the word myth. I use it just because you do, because the word myth is oftentimes misunderstood as meaning uh, mistaken belief or something you don't have to take seriously. And I'm not going to do an exposition of the Garden of Eden stories now to um, kind of underline my point of how profoundly true I think those stories are, even though I don't for a moment think they're factual. And, you know, for me, I mean, I don't know how your high school teacher talked about the moral meaning of the raising of Lazarus, that uh, if it's something as uh, trivial as, uh, well, there's always new life, you know? Uh, and I also don't know how capable you were as a late adolescent of really understanding what he was saying. I think as a late adolescent, I tended to think if something isn't factual, then it's not true, okay? Um, now I would say, <clears throat> my understanding of Easter, which I'm not insisting upon, but this is a dialogue now, 
it's not something as vapid as, well, spring comes every year. You know, after the death of winter, now we have the rebirth of things. My understanding of Easter is uh, pretty specific. Jesus continues to be experienced as a figure of the present. And Jesus is Lord. And so I would want to ask you, what is added to what I'm saying by saying, and his corpse was physically transformed? I mean, what's, what's the additional significance of, of making that really important? Well, I, what I would say to that is that what's the, and again, to rephrase the question is, what is added by... Uh, acknowledging the physical resurrection of Jesus or his corpse was transformed yeah, yeah. is that God is not just the God of spirit but he is the God of creation and and he is sovereign over this world in all of its aspects not just the spiritual realm but also yeah. the physical and he uh, it, and I, I wouldn't say that in the sense of, and I think there's, there is a, a widespread view that, and it's because we've been so taught a secular world view that a dichotomy between spiritual and material, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that the physical world is mm -hmm. sort of working like a, a clock that's been wound up and is going to work itself out. And I'm not saying that God just invades the, the inner workings of the clock every now and then, but what I would say is God is sovereign over all of, all of that. That sometimes he works within history in usual ways, providentially. Mm -hmm. There's stories of that in the Bible, like the story of Joseph, where Joseph concludes this, the uh, acknowledgement with his brothers that the things that you did and the things that happened, you may have meant them for evil, but God meant them for good. And God was ordering and directing things. But then there's also God interacting with time and space and history in more dramatic ways. The Exodus being an example and, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And what that says is that, that our bodies matter to Jesus and they matter to God. And that, that, that God is doing something in time and space and history that is transformational. Mm -hmm. And there will be a day that will come where we will receive new bodies, resurrected bodies. If you don't have a physical resurrection of Jesus from the dead, how can you have any hope that the promises of God of a new heavens and a new earth are guaranteed? Mm -hmm. these, these things matter. Mm -hmm. um, I also think it matters from the standpoint of what it says to all people in, in all of the earth. One of the things that, um, and I, I pulled this uh, passage earlier from the book of Acts. Paul was preaching at a, at a um, place in Athens, the Areopagus. And he's addressing people that are interested in the plurality of religious viewpoints. And he makes an interesting argument. He says, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And so he, he um, calls them to a, a view of God. But then he says, in the past you've been worshiping false gods and idols. And he says, in, in, in the past God overlooked this type of ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he's fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ in its definiteness <clears throat> says to all people on this planet that there is absolute truth and God is the authority and Jesus Christ is the Lord of all. And you have to come to terms with his lordship if you are a human being. Mm -hmm.
I, uh, it's hard to quantify. I agree with maybe two-thirds of what you've just said. Maybe only 58 percent. But I mean, it's hard <laughs> to quantify. Okay. And, and let me uh, name a couple of things that I agree with completely. Bodies matter to God. Absolutely. This is the central testimony of the Old Testament and of the New Testament as well. Uh, and when I say bodies, I mean human beings. And, and God is passionate about uh, the reduction or elimination of all of the unnecessary sources of human misery that there are in the world. And so in that sense, the Bible is not spiritual. Now, you know, I'm not saying it's not religious, but I mean, it's very much concerned with material existence and bodies and so forth. And I agree also that God is Lord and sovereign of all, including the material world and not just some spiritual world. I think this is utterly central to, um, again, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's the movement from there to uh, therefore God does spectacular things like raising a corpse that uh, I think it's a little bit of a big leap and um, it's well let me put a period there and illustrate what I mean when I say uh, you're completely right. God is passionate about our bodies. Think of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, think of the petition, Your kingdom come on earth as it already is in heaven. It's the heart of Jesus' message, the coming of God's kingdom on earth. And what would the coming of God's kingdom on earth mean? Uh, it would mean the transformation of the humanly created world of societies into what Desmond Tutu, as well as uh, before him, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank on her name, it'll come back to me So called the dream of God. And God's dream is the transformation of this world into a world uh, in which everybody has enough of the material basis of existence. Let me go back to the Lord's Prayer. What follows your kingdom come on earth? Give us today our daily bread. And bread, of course, there is a, a symbol for food, the material basis of life. And for the peasant audience that Jesus addressed, and 90% of the population in the Jewish homeland in the first century was from the peasant class, which included not just agricultural workers, but manual laborers. For them, enough food was the central issue of existence. The coming of the kingdom of God means bread for the world. And I'm just underlining complete agreement. Bodies matter enormously to God. This world and this world becoming a place of fairness and, and peace and so forth. That's the dream of God. So, amen, amen, amen. Uh, and then I would go on to say, just as for you, uh, hearing that the resurrection is maybe a moral story rather than a report of something that happened, caused you a loss of faith. <laughs> For me, it was thinking that I had to believe that the virgin birth really happened, and that I had to believe that God did this for Jesus, but for nobody else in human history that became stumbling blocks. And I, um, maybe I've said enough in response to that. Let me ask you this, though, Charlie. Does Easter, 
have anything to do for you with the hope for an afterlife? Well, I, I think that that is a component of the Easter story, is that God is a God of life. I don't think that's primarily the point. Okay. Um, I agree. <laughs> certainly, pe certainly people of that day and age believed in the afterlife. Mm -hmm. um, the point of, of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not to affirm spiritual existence of life after death, but that in this life and in this age, the new age of the kingdom co has come, and that the new creation has come now of which Jesus' resurrection is the first fruits of what will become not a spiritual existence in heaven, but the fullness of the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven, mm -hmm. with a new, new heavens and a new earth. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I would say that the Christian hope is not so much that we will go to heaven when we die, mm -hmm. but the Christian hope is in the very message of the resurrection that that there will be a new heavens and a new earth mm -hmm. now christian christians are called to enact mm -hmm. that and to live into that new heavens and new earth now but jesus taught and the new testament teaches that the coming of the of the kingdom of god on earth as it is in heaven will be greatly resisted Mm -hmm. by the powers of this world. It has been for 2,000 years, yes. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, the fullness of that coming kingdom will not ever be fully realized without the dramatic resurrection of Jesus uh, raising his people at the end of the age. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think Charlie will get his body back? I don't think it'll be a body like this, at least I hope not. Yeah, um, yeah. This body is uh, getting older and older, and I'm, I feel that after I hit 40, and I'm... Um, oh, a youngster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I think that's what Paul, Paul teaches in um, Corinthians when he says, the, the resurrected body is different from the earthly body. And I, I wouldn't for a minute say that Jesus is resurrected body was the same as right. his earthly body. Um, Paul, Paul says it's, it has a different characteristic in that it's imperishable. And uh, so Jesus was not simply resuscitated or reincarnated so that he could die again, as some religions teach, mm -hmm. but, but the resurrection is, is eternal and it's investing of life to the body mm -hmm. and and so it's it's not um, it's not just spiritual mm -hmm. it's got a physicality to it but I don't know that Tom in his physics class uh, would be would be able to uh, measure that at this point mm -hmm. yeah. and and let me for your sake out there um, underline uh, and continue what you've just been talking about, Charlie, and if I say more than you would have wanted to say, you can tell me that. But, um, you know, there's a fairly crude understanding of the resurrection and the afterlife out there in, uh, you know, many Christian circles. Uh, that um, the resurrection is bodily in some kind of straightforward way and that uh, the afterlife involves the continuation of personal self-awareness and so forth. And, and, you know, that's not what Paul says. Might not even be what Jesus thought. But from 1 Corinthians 15, which you were alluding to, Paul speaks of radical discontinuity between uh, the physical body and what he calls a spiritual body. Uh, the physical body is a body of flesh and blood. Uh, uh, the spiritual body is a, not a body of flesh and blood, but a glorified body. 
And as he tries to express uh, the continuity, he uses an image of radical discontinuity. You'll recognize it when I start to recall it. He compares the physical body to a seed that is sown into the ground and the spiritual body to the full-grown plant. Uh, think of a tree, just to make it an extraordinarily big plant. You know, the difference between an acorn and an oak tree, enormous. Obviously, there's continuity, but it's hard to imagine a metaphor that can better combine continuity with radical discontinuity. My point being, uh, yeah, Paul affirms a spiritual body, but what, what the hell is a spiritual body? I'm not mocking it with that language. It, 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 it really transcends anything I can imagine. And that doesn't mean I dismiss it. I'm just saying, I don't, you know, I don't know if Marcus will have a glorified body. And it's not because I doubt the teaching. I just, um, I'm not sure that the New Testament teaches the continuation of personal identity beyond death. A story from Jesus. Um, it's a very familiar story to all of you. Uh, the story of, um, you know, it's the Sadducees come to Jesus and, and tell him a story of a woman who's been married to seven brothers in a row with each of them dying. And so she marries the next one down the line. And then the Sadducees, who did not believe in uh, a resurrection from the dead, uh, they're thinking this question will really, you know, expose how stupid that notion is. They say to Jesus, now in the life of the age to come, whose wife will she be? It's a decent question. If you think that whether you call it the afterlife or the resurrection life uh, means the continuation of individual existence and self-consciousness. Whose wife will she be? And the answer of Jesus is really intriguing. In some ways it's a non-answer, but it's also a very evocative, enigmatic answer. He says, in the life of the age to come, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage, but they shall be like the holy angels. Let me pause there for a moment. Okay, so what does that mean? That, yeah, we'll all have our personal identity, it's just that there won't be any sex? You know? And what does it mean to be like the holy angels? Is, is that, again, about being sexless beings? Or is it, you know, this is way beyond our understanding. And then that passage ends that said, do you not know what was said at the bush? I am the God of the living, not the God of the dead. Well, what does that mean? Uh, I don't know. But again, it's evocative. Is it a way of saying, this whole message isn't about what happens after death. This message is about the living. I'm not confident it means that. My basic point is this. When the New Testament does seek to speak about whether it's life after death or the resurrection life, um, it becomes highly metaphorical and evocative. And, uh, and I, th I don't think I'm saying that directly in response to you, but just... Well, I would agree, I would agree with that. I mean, I, I think uh, the challenge for people has always been to understand what's going to happen in the future. Yeah. Uh, we, we have a, a hope of a, of a resurrection of the dead, but that hope is guaranteed for us by a historic event that happened in the past. And, mm -hmm. and yeah. so it matters for that very reason. The hope is not an unwarranted hope or a, a pie in the sky kind of hope, but it's a hope that is grounded in, in the actions of God in time and space in our, mm -hmm. in our lifetime. 
And, and that's a powerful hope for people because, I mean, we live in a really great country and we have a really wonderful existence in this life. But I think Paul's exactly right. If, if for this life only we have lived, then we are of all people most to be pitied. This life has a lot of challenges. And for most of the people of this world, that hope of the resurrection of the dead in the last day is, is what gets them through the day today. Um, I want to I go back to one thing. Um, one of the things that I, I think the, the, resur the bodily resurrection of Jesus does, and, I, and I, I'm grateful that you shared a little bit of your story too, and how the virgin birth, for example, is a difficulty. But wouldn't it change your perspective on the virgin birth, for example, if you did come to a place of belief in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead? <laughs> yeah, if you can believe in the physical transformation of the, of the um, or in the, you know, the, the transformation of the physical body of Jesus so that the tomb was empty. Yeah, the virgin birth is not much of a problem after that. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> but, but this raises a larger question. Um, and then we'll go to the audience. We've gone on a long time up here, I know. I don't know how one could take seriously that Jesus was conceived without a human father or that his corpse, uh, his physical corpse, was transformed by God so that the tomb was empty. I don't know how one, not just you, but how anyone can believe that without also believing in divine intervention. That God did this utterly remarkable thing in the conception of Jesus and that on a particular night or morning in the past, God did this utterly remarkable thing for the corpse of Jesus. And, uh, and I might be digging myself into a deeper hole here, okay? But I don't believe in divine intervention. And the reason is, if you believe God ever intervenes, then all of the non-interventions become inexplicable. I know that's a different conversation, but it kind of springboards on if well, I believe it, it gets to the story the of Job. Tomb, it could, yeah. I mean, you, you have to begin to wrestle with the problem of evil at that point. Right. But, but I'm not going to let God off the hook. Uh, God, God uh, has revealed himself in history and as a God who does. And you, I mean, I've read your books. I know you believe that he intervenes in healing. Uh, oh, I never use the language of intervention. Okay. I, think, I think paranormal healings happen. Why? Uh, paranormal might strike you as a weasel word. <laughs> it means we don't know the explanation. Okay. But we know that some people throughout history have had the ability to perform healings that we have no explanation for. For me, intervention is meant to be an explanation. Well, and if, I think it tries to... If acknowledge. what you mean by intervention, that we live in a closed system <coughs> universe, mm -hmm. which is the secular way of looking at things, and God every now and then comes in and zaps things and does things, then yeah, I don't agree with that either. But that's not the teaching of the scriptures. Mm -hmm. The scriptures teach that God is is the one who holds all, the th all of the universe together. That it's in him we live and we move and we have our being. That he, he is the ground of all being and the, the source of life. And so for him to work in the usual ways is God working and, in a sense, intervening, but, but doing it in the usual way. For him to do it in a more dramatic way is just God doing, doing his thing. Uh, that's, the creation itself is dramatic. I mean, we walk around in an amphitheater of the glory of God. Yeah. And, and it's, it's amazing and it's just 
scope and creation. And the physics professor over there, I'm sure, marvels at how wondrous mm -hmm. uh, physics is. Mm -hmm. um, or the human body and its design. Do you think of, uh, let's say, God being the indirect cause of everything and the direct cause of some things? I, I believe he's sovereign over all things. Yeah. I don't know that you can really get away from special acts of God if you go with a virgin birth and a transformation of a well, corpse. Well, the way the scriptures describe it is the mighty acts of God. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and it's... It, but I mean, you know... You but, know. But, but, but here's, here's yeah. what I would say to you. To teach that those mighty acts are not historically valid or truthful or, or historically accurate is is to actually take all the power out of the story in itself. And there we disagree. I think the story of the Exodus is a story of liberation from bondage because it is God's will that we not be in bondage to the pharaohs of this world it is enormously powerful. If I think the story of the Exodus requires that I believe that the sea really did split in two, that the ten plagues really happened and so forth, then I just think, well, if God did those things back then, why doesn't God rescue people in a similarly dramatic way now? But isn't that the whole point of what those... I mean, it, even if you read them parabolically and you say, well, that story is about liberation from bondage... And God's passion that and we... And God's be passion that... Yeah. Well, do we have any faith or belief that God will actually liberate us and, and release us from bondage in the here and now if we don't think that he did that in the past? Or is it up to us to liberate ourselves from bondage? You know, and then we'll go to the audience. I'm not sure if I've used this phrase. And I'm enjoying this dialogue, Charlie. I don't sure. feel any Great. acrimony at all. Um, a theological notion that I want to mention to you, it's very simple. A two-word phrase. Divine consistency. It's the notion that however God acted in the past, God continues to do so now, and, and vice versa, of course. And so I take that seriously. And so I can't imagine why God would do these quite frankly, very spectacular things in the past, and then stop. Now, I agree with you. I think the whole world is filled with the glory of God. I find, at least in my good moments, uh, uh, the sheer existence of everything to be utterly marvelous. But I, I don't see things like you know, the sea parting in two to save people happening now. And that's why I say, you know, I think these are stories that are told for their meaning. And anyway, should we go to the audience, Absolutely. see what you want to ask about? Yeah. We will take questions. Does anyone have questions? Yeah, let's start. Please, we're recording this. Um, I see one side taking a direct and literal, literal approach from biblical scripture. If one is to take a literal approach to these stories, what is one to believe to enact and to live by and the multiplicity of rules and instructions for living, i.e. Deuteronomy versus New Testament, etc.? Well, what, um, there's two, two things I would say about, uh, um, about that. One is God makes covenants with his people and that has been the history of the relationship and the continuity of God with the Israelites to the to people who follow Jesus is that God wants to be in relationship he's revealed himself to us as one who wants to be in a relationship and just like uh, a relationship of a marriage we we make certain relational commitments when we enter into a covenant uh, forsaking all others to be faithful to you as long as we both shall live and the the kind of um, words that God gives the Israelites uh, to, in Deuteronomy are, be faithful to me. 
I'm setting you apart as a special people. I want you to live a particular way so that you will shine with my holiness and glory for all the world to see and enter into a relationship with me through your mediation of my covenant to the world. The new covenant, this is the second piece of that, there is a difference between the new covenant and the old covenant. And so while those laws and rules in Deuteronomy are fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ, the teaching of the New Testament is, with the new covenant, a new reality and a deeper way of relating to God happens. That he takes laws that were written externally on tablets of stone and he writes those laws on our hearts. And so uh, a person has an inward and internal motivation by the indwelling of the spirit of the living God to do the very things that, that, um, that God is calling us to, to be faithful to him. And, the, and, and so the, the rules of the Christian faith are really relation, relational, is the way I would put it, and calling us to be the people that God desires us to be as we are in relationship with him. Mm -hmm. I would add only that I think and I don't think this is, uh, well, I won't worry about whether it's different from what you just said. I think of the Old Covenant and the New Covenant running throughout both the Old Testament and the New Testament and through subsequent Christian history. The contrast between uh, a covenant that is based upon rules that kind of stand external to the self and you try to meet them versus a new heart, a transformed heart. I think the new heart, the transformed heart, happened in the time of ancient Israel as well. And I think that tension between uh, trying to follow a set of rules for the sake of fulfilling a contract with God, you find that in contemporary Christianity today, and you also find in contemporary Christianity today and throughout the centuries. Uh, uh, the emphasis upon the transformation of the self at its deepest level. Okay? And uh, then, you know, my, my approach to scripture may or may not be different from yours, but I always think it's helpful when thinking about the laws and the rules of scripture and so forth, to think of scripture as the product of our spiritual ancestors in these two ancient communities. I mean, historically, that's what it is. And so it contains their wisdom and insight. It also contains their limited vision. In some cases, it includes their blindness. I, uh, I'll be bold and I'll say, I think it's important for Christians to be able to say, you know, sometimes the Bible is wrong. Not that, well, it was right for its time, but no longer, which is a soft form of that. But I think there's stuff in both Testaments that are presented as commands that were never the will of God. And, and I'm not trashing the Bible. I'm just saying that sometimes a kind of... Um, I don't know, reverence for the Bible will lead us in some cases to try to make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. And uh, um, I think there just are some stuff there that was never the will of God. I won't give you examples, I could. Um, just to clarify, um, would it be safe to say that all instances of what appears to be divine inter intervention should be read parabolically on your view? Um, yes. Okay. Do you um, want to follow on? So, <laughs> yeah, my follow-up would be, when I'm like looking into the gospel accounts, specifically Luke, um, in his introduction to his work, Luke Acts, he says, I intended to draw up an account of the events that have taken place, so I interviewed eyewitnesses. He specifically references them and then says that he's investigated things from the beginning. It seems to be uh, that that would apply to the whole work and for him to mm -hmm. wane in and out of parable without warning um, 
seems mm -hmm. to be a forced reading of the narrative. <clears throat> it, it depends upon whether an ancient author is identifying truth with factuality, as we would expect a modern journalist, not an opinion writer, but a journalist to do. Uh, and that identification of truth with factuality is largely a product of the modern world. I don't mean that the ancients couldn't make that distinction. But um, uh, let me use as an example uh, the Greek historian Thucydides. And many scholars have said that Luke's rhetorical style and so forth uh, seems somewhat indebted to Thucydides. Not that he had copied Thucydides, don't get me wrong. Thucydides is also about 400 years before the New Testament. And Thucydides, commonly uh, viewed as the greatest of the Greek historians, says uh, in his histories of the Peloponnesian Wars that uh, Many of the characters in his stories make speeches, including generals and whatnot. And Thucydides explicitly says, now, of course, nobody knows what they said on that occasion. And so I have written what it would have been appropriate for them to say on that occasion. Now, Thucydides, you know, there's just not that distinction between truth and factuality such, we, such as we might make in the modern world. Now, do I think that some of the things that are reported in the stories of the Gospels actually happen? Yeah. And I think, you know, there uh, are fairly decent criteria for making those judgments, probability judgments. Do I think the authors of the Gospels were concerned with historical exactitude? No. And the clearest evidence of that is to look at uh, what Matthew and Luke do with Mark when they copy Mark. They feel very free to make changes, to add stories, modify stories. So that modern concern with um, historical exactitude I don't think it applies in general to ancient writings. I, I think Luke knew the difference between what he calls an idle tale and one that isn't. And uh, when the women, an example of that is actually the resurrection story. When the women come back to the disciples and report their experience to, uh, to the other apostles, Luke says the other, the disciples felt like they were, might be ta telling an idle tale right right um, and then Luke a cockamamie story <laughs> might be uh, uh, a yeah. good way of putting that and Luke Luke also actually has in his book of Acts one of the earliest sermons that was ever preached related to the resurrection it happened 50 days after the crucifixion and resurrection on the day of Pentecost where Peter is very careful to make a distinction between his confidence in the um, death and burial of the King David, and, and, he's, and he says, I'm confident that David's tomb is with us to this day. But then he goes on to say, Jesus Christ uh, rose from the dead, and, and he uh, talks about his flesh not seeing corruption. I, I think that's the, the earliest... Uh, account of the resurrection and it's right on the heels of it. It's not the long-term develop, mm -hmm. development of those stories. I mean, maybe you might say it's Luke. I don't know what Peter really said, so let me tell you what well, I think he said. But I mean, that's a good point because Acts almost certainly wasn't written before 90. And so this is an account from six decades after the events uh, who knows? I mean, Peter's sermon there, uh, it's what, two minutes long if you read it? I bet if Peter did preach a sermon on Pentecost, it was longer than that. Now, you might say, well, it's the gist of his sermon, and that would be a fair comment. But since you brought up the first couple chapters of Acts, 
as an example of how Luke is not concerned with historical exactitude. At the end of Luke's Gospel, Luke 24, 50 through 53, as I recall, Jesus ascends into heaven on the evening of what we call Easter Day. It was a long day, okay, because we got the Emmaus Road story, we got the upper room, we got all of that. And then Jesus ascends into heaven. In the first chapter of Acts, Jesus ascends into heaven 50 days later. 40, but... I'm sorry, 40 days <laughs> later. And then Pentecost is 50 days later. Now, and, and the same author wrote both books. There's right. unanimity about that. Now, was the author of Luke so absent-minded that he forgot by the time he started chapter 1 of Acts that he had already had Jesus ascend a few verses earlier? Or is it clear he's not dealing with chronological time? You know, that uh, it's appropriate to end the gospel with Jesus returning to God, and it's appropriate to begin the, the, the volume that talks about, you know, the birth, the coming of the Spirit, the birth of the post-Easter community and so forth, with Jesus ascending to God. He's, he's dealing with, I don't know, what do you want to call it? Liturgical time, not chronological time, something like that. And it's, it's, um, none of this is about trashing scripture for me. Uh, it's, it's about trying to understand it for what it is rather than imposing modern standards of if it says something happened, then it, either it happened or it's not true. I mean, that's a pervasively modern way of thinking. I'm not suggesting that's how you think. But, but it's out there. Yeah. Right. I think you, you answered part of my, the question I was going to ask you. Um, I thought I heard you say something to the fact that you think that Christians, when they read the Bible, should look at it in more than one way, or do we accept it for what it says? Yeah, should we look at it in more than one way or accept it for what it says? Well, the issue is, what is it saying? <laughs> So what would it mean to accept it for what it says? Um, let me use a quick example here. Uh, part of accepting the Bible for what it says would mean paying attention to what kind of language is being used in a text. And by that I don't mean Greek or Hebrew. But, uh, you know, if, if something is a hymn, then taking it for what it says means reading it as a hymn. If something is poetic, then taking it for what it says means reading it poetically. If something is a metaphorical narrative, then taking it for what it says means reading it for a metaphorical narrative. So. I don't know if that's helpful or not, but it means it's really important not to assume, uh, you know, this is why literal interpretation of the Bible, even though half of American Protestants say they take the Bible literally, it's actually impossible. I mean, what does it mean to take a poem literally? Actually, it would mean to take it as a poem. but. <laughs> People who take the Bible literally aren't very often willing to do that, you know. So uh, reading the Bible for what it says means paying attention to how it says it. One of, one of the things that I would say about the Bible and its authority is the authority of the scriptures comes actually from things like the resurrection event. That God validates and vindicates his word and the authority of the ambassadors of the word by, the, by his actions in the lives of his ambassadors. The supreme example of that is what the Exodus Mount Sinai event. That event 
is recorded in the book of Exodus in order to say Moses' teaching is authoritatively from God. The same uh, is done in the New Testament with regards to the um, actions of Jesus in the lives of the apostles. An example is the book of Second Peter where Peter says, we didn't follow cleverly devised myths and stories when we made known to you the power of the Lord's coming. But we were eyewitnesses of his glory and majesty when the Lord spoke to him on the holy mountain and said, this is my son. And so Peter is actually using a, the dramatic event of, in this case, the transfiguration to give his word and the apostolic word authority as, in a sense, prophetic authority. And he goes on to say that. He says, no prophecy of Scripture comes about by a man's own interpretation, but by people carried along by the Holy Spirit of God. The, the actions of God in the lives of his ambassadors validates their word. Their word would actually be irrelevant if those things didn't happen in their lives. I mean, they deep thoughts by Moses or deep thoughts by the Apostle Peter, what gives them their power and authority is the fact that God has authorized these people to speak on his behalf. To make sure I've got the sequence right, you're suggesting that believing in the resurrection becomes the basis for taking the rest of the teaching seriously? I think the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the case of the, of the New Testament fundamentally changes the way that you look at everything. It, for example, might change the way you look at the virgin birth and the other aspects of the teaching of the New Testament. It may mean that you reconnect the Jesus of history and the Jesus of faith, that those actually aren't two Jesuses but one. But it also says something about the authority of the divine word yeah. and the word of God. That, that the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ uh, validates God's spoken word. So it becomes kind of an element in a syllogism. Uh, it proves something about Jesus or proves something about the Bible because Jesus has been raised from the dead. Therefore, he is the Son of God or therefore the Bible has authority or... Well, if Jesus all... Uh, there were plenty of people that claimed to be messianic during that time and died mm -hmm. on the uh, crosses of Rome. Right, they probably weren't as impressive as Jesus. <laughs> yeah. But what, what vindicates him? God. Yes, and the resurrection. Well, and we go back again. <laughs> See, let, let, let me be really clear. I have no problem with the resurrection of Jesus. I just don't want to get fixated on the tomb had to be empty because God transformed his corpse. For me, the resurrection of Jesus means Jesus continues to be experienced and God has said yes to Jesus. That is, God has vindicated Jesus. God has made Jesus both Lord and Christ. And so, uh, I know we're coming close to the end. Um, and I, I don't think you would agree, disagree Maybe I should ask you, would you disagree that Jesus continues to be experienced by some people to this day? Absolutely. And, and that God has said yes to Jesus and no to the powers that killed him? Yes. And I, and I would also add to that, and I, and I hope you will take away from this, that you have to wrestle with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is, it is a one-time event in world history that lays a claim on your life. God has said of Jesus, he is Lord, in his uh, great vindication of his son. And, and wrestling with that is actually, in the promise of the scriptures, where we find hope and salvation. Not only in this life, yes, but for all eternity. God calls us to put our faith and trust in him. And uh, he offers a, a tremendously rich and abundant life for those who do.
I'm going to have to step in, and I sincerely apologize, I know. Unfortunately, we have to give the room back to Rollins, and the students actually have to go to class, which uh, mm. sometimes mm. classes get in the way of education. <laughs> so I'd like to thank our, our guests.